I think there's a lot of options. I think that people just aren't satisfied with the options that that do exist. You know, the affordability in home care is on average about twenty four dollars an average, twenty four dollars an hour in the U.S. So if you need twenty four seven care, that's seventeen grand a month to have someone come into your home and take care of you. That's not affordable, right? Yeah. So then you say, okay, well, don't worry. I, I'll take nights and weekends. I just need the caregiver during the day when I go to work to take care of mom or dad. That's still over four grand. And then you just lost your nights and weekends. You're listening to the Rich State of Mind Show, the podcast made to make you the total package in the entrepreneurial world and give you what we call a rich state state of of mind. mind. If you are here looking to learn about real estate investing, marketing, elevating your business, and developing your mindset to get to the next level, then you are at the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join our community on richstateofmind.com. Now here's your host, Anthony Ritchie. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Rich Day Mom. We're talking to Isabel Smith. Isabel is a graduate of Arizona State University, a former flight attendant, former Walt Disney World intern, and now currently a Residential Assisted Living Academy's leading lady. She's been acting as a COO for the last six years, keeping everyone in line and on task. Uh, she's been featured in many magazines and articles on the topic of senior housing, and most recently was given the title as one of the top influencers in senior housing. Isabel has also won Aging Media's The Future Leaders of Assistant Living, awarded in 2020, being two of 100s under 30 to make the list. So uh, Isabel has accomplished a lot in the short amount of time she's been on this planet. Uh, I enjoy, really enjoyed this episode with her, learned a lot about assisted living for senior citizens. And I think you could too, as far as those that are interested in real estate investing and finding a different uh, asset class to uh, attack. So as always, thank you for listening and please enjoy. Hey, Isabel, thanks for taking the time this evening for getting on the Rich State of Mind podcast. We're going to be talking about senior assisted living and um, it's real estate investing, but a different form. Never talked about it. So I really appreciate you coming on to give your take and to educate our audience on something new. So if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having us. So um, I'm Isabel Garino Smith. I teach and train for the Residential Assisted Living Academy. We're a real estate training company that shows people how to own, operate, or invest in residential assisted living. So senior housing, but in a residential setting. Uh, and that's uh, and why do you emphasize, emphasize on residential? If somebody, if somebody's like, all right, well, what about commercial? Why do you emphasize on residential? Yes, we focus on residential because we're kind of the antithesis of the big box, the commercial facilities, the Brookdale, the Sunrise Atrium. Those facilities are still great investments, but we're like the opposite of them as far as care uh, and quality and what we're trying to be. We're trying to really like, differentiate between what we are and what the traditional assisted living facility looks like in most people's minds. Gotcha. Uh, Well, before I start asking all the technical things, what even got you into this? Yeah, great question. So honestly, for us, it started at home. My grandmother fell, she broke her hip and the doctor was like, she needs 24 seven care. Who's going to come live with her? And at that point, it's like, who's going to quit their job and take care of mom 24 seven? Are we going to bring in home care into her home or do we put her into a home? And as soon as you say it, you feel kind of sick and guilty and you're like, oh, God, we can't do that to grandma. So we searched and searched everywhere in upstate New York where she was living at the time. Didn't find anything suitable. Honestly, we were disgusted by what we found. And so we did choose to go with in-home care, which is ridiculously expensive. It's really a short-term option, not a long-term option. Um, In the meantime, we went back to Arizona where we were living and we're searching and searching. We kind of stumbled into residential assisted living. And my dad, being the real estate investor and entrepreneur that he was, you know, said, instead of just purchasing a bed for grandma to stay in within this home, he's like, I want to buy the real estate and the business off of you from the owner. And she ended up selling it to him. And so he kind of jumped in with, with two feet with the intent for my grandmother, his mom to move in. She passed before we 
you know, owned the home. So she didn't end up living in the home. But once he saw not only the numbers, but just the impact he was making on the community, he was like, oh man, I've, I've got to keep doing this. So we went from one home, two homes, three homes. And then we've been training people on it for the last eight plus years. So it's been a lot of fun along the way, getting other people, you know, involved and excited about the industry. What's gotten the industry to kind of take off? Is it because of the poor treatment in some of these uh, nursing homes? Is it the affordability? Uh, I think, for Yeah, I think there's a lot of options. I think that people just aren't satisfied with the options that that do exist, you know, the affordability in home care is on average about $24 an average, $24 an hour in the U S. So if you need 24 seven care, that's 17 grand a month to have someone come into your home and take care of you, that's not affordable. Right. Yeah. So then you say, okay, well, don't worry. I, I'll take nights and weekends. I just need the caregiver during the day when I go to work to take care of mom or dad that's still over four grand. And then you just lost your nights and weekends. Say goodbye to soccer games or wine nights. Like your life is over. So, you know, then people say, okay, well now I need to put them into a home. And we all think of a facility, a big box facility. So I think that there's just like a, a, a gap in the industry where people are saying we need something different. So there's about 20,000 of these homes across the country, the smaller assisted living care homes. So they exist and they have existed. Just it's really been run mom and pop and how we're teaching it is really to run it as a real estate investor. So that's the difference kind of that we're coming from. Okay. So now I'll ask what, what is assisted living entail? Uh, as to, you know, 24 hour, 24 seven, you know, help. Uh, so what, you know, do they have, and I'm, excuse my ignorance, but it's like, <laughs> is it like a button that they press? Like, Hey, I need help. Somebody come through, please. Like, how does that kind of work on a day to day? And it, you know, give the family members some peace of mind that their family members are being taken care of. Yeah, absolutely. So within the home, right, there's 24 seven caregivers and there's a licensed administrator who's kind of running the operations for you. So you as the investor own the real estate, own the business and kind of passively in are investing in that sense. Okay. The administrator is running all that day to day, but it is 24 seven care. So these seniors, it's not golden girls, right? They don't just need light landscaping and a light bulb screwed in. No, no, no. They need help. They need help getting up out of bed, brushing their hair, brushing their teeth, going to the bathroom, showering, eating their food, whatever it may be for that particular senior. They usually need help with five to seven ADLs, activities of daily living. So really just anything you do throughout the day. So those caregivers are there um, taking care of their needs. So it's, it's a home. It doesn't need to be like, we still do have the buttons, right. To say, Hey, it's sometimes it's a pendant that they wear or something, oh, okay. room, different things like that, but it's a home. Like you can see everyone a lot more clearly than you can in a five-story building with 50 beds on each floor, you know, that they're really relying on those buttons here it, in a home. It's very different because it's more like, oh, where's Betty? She's in her room. I'll go check on her. You know, like there's only maybe six to 16 residents in the home. So the, the landlord is mostly communicating with the agency, not the, the actual tenant. They're not communicating with the tenants. None of my residents know who I am. You know, we own those homes and we, and they don't know who I am. They know who the licensed administrator is Mm -hmm. and they probably assume that she owns the home and I'm okay with that. I don't want them to know me. You know, I want to be able to set this up so that it's an opportunity and an option for families who need something else, you know, and, and to be able to play that role. Okay, so what's the process of setting it up? So I, earlier I had told you hey, I'm in the process of renovating a single family home. At what point would I seek uh, somebody out like you to, um, you know, transition into having uh, this type of service, provide this type of service? Yeah, we we definitely get people all throughout the process, but I always advise you come first <laughs> to mm-hmm. make sure that you find out everything that you need to know. So if you are interested in getting into this business at all, educate yourself, you know, before you kind of jump in with both feet, because mm-hmm. there are a lot of rules and regulations and hoops to jump through. And I always want to make sure that you're saving yourself 
time, money, and energy. But in the fastest layman's term, it's you're purchasing and or leasing a property. You're retrofitting it, renovating it to become senior friendly. You're getting the license on the property, hiring that administrator who will then hire your caregivers and your marketing to fill the home once it's full. And once you kind of have those you know, rules and regulations and policies up and going, it's its own running business. And then you can kind of step back and be more hands-off after the setup phase is done. Gotcha. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the process when I was setting up uh, one of my units for Section 8. Like there were some rules, regulations, you know, inspections that had to be made. Uh, like I remember I had to put a, a rail on the steps. I think yeah. it was more than like, I don't know, maybe three or four steps I had to put over it. Yep. It's very similar to group housing, recovery homes, clean and sober homes for vets, things like that. It's a similar licensing with the state. It's just the difference is making it senior safe, right? So you had to do some stipulations. We probably have to do a little bit more. Gotcha. And so from what I'm understanding is that what makes the difference between this type of uh, assisted living and nursing homes is it feels more like a home. It it feels more accommodating and not a not an adult daycare, senior daycare. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, we always like to say the big box facilities are marketing themselves as home-like. We're not home-like. Home-like. We're we're a home. Like (laughs) we literally are in a single family neighborhood, just like you probably grew up in, right? We didn't grow up in hotel looking, hospital-like feeling, big, huge buildings. We grew up in homes or apartments for the most part. So it's important to still have that feeling just because you're old doesn't mean you want to go live in a hospital for the last couple of years of your life. You know, you want those comforts of home and you want to feel like this is your home. Yeah, And from my, when I was looking at the stats, uh, it was every day there's 10,000 people turning 65. Yes, every day, and, yeah. and I think it's 4,000 turning 85 every day. There's 77 million baby boomers. They're not currently living in assisted living. It's the silent generation right now. And in the next 10, 20 years is when the baby boomers are going to need care and assistance. So really when people are looking at the market and saying, what's coming up ahead, right? Everyone's kind of freaked out about inflation. Do I make a move yeah. right now? What do I do? In, in my opinion, and of course I'm biased because I'm in this industry, but it's really obvious. Follow the money. The baby boomers have been literally making all the trends in our markets for the last 70 years. They're going to keep doing it for, the, for their last 20 years. So why not continue to follow them into assisted living? That's where they're going, you know? So definitely massive need. That's interesting as you say that. Um because I, I had read that somewhere. And I think it was after I saw, um, you know, we were going to link up for this interview. I saw, I saw that like, hey, you know, they took care of us for pretty much seven years. And now we take care of them. Yeah. And uh, still, we're, we are able to uh, utilize that generation in a different way. Uh, and and it, you're right, it is you know, people talk about, you know, the market crash. And I don't know if you follow stocks, but things have been going down really bad right now. But I, I always say the money didn't go anywhere. It just went somewhere else. Somewhere else, the market is thriving. And you just have to identify what that is and make that pivot, whether you feel comfortable doing that or not. But yep. it doesn't just disappear. Um, yep. It probably went back in somebody's pockets or it went to somewhere else. Absolutely. It's really important to obviously look out for those things and see those trends. And if you if you do follow that, it's like when all of these baby boomers need care, what's going to happen to their homes? Right. We're going to have a massive amount of homes on the market very soon one day. You know, so it's like it's coming. It's just is that where the millennials want to be living? Probably not. (laughs) Right. So then what do we do? We have all these homes, but they're not in the places that the people who want to buy homes are what's going to happen. It's interesting to think about it because it's a big dilemma, you know, Um, and and that's something that will be fun to watch play out. But what I know for sure, my crystal ball is telling me right that when they leave their home, they're going to need care and assistance. So why can't I be the one who owns that real estate who can supply that for them? You know, the demand is going to be significantly greater than the supply. We couldn't build enough beds to fill the demand that's to come. So getting in now is the best thing you could ever do because not only could you cash flow for the next 20 years, but also you could if you got a, a pack of them, if you got 10 of them or whatever, package them up, sell them off to the hedge funds. You could make great bank just cashing out. You know, you don't have mm-hmm. to 
hold on to this forever. It, it's kind of however you want to play that game, you can. Is this something that can be government funded if I was trying to buy some real estate and I told them, you know, what I'm trying to do? Yeah, there are certain government grants that you can use for this, but it's not as significant as it is for those with clean, sober, recovery, justice needs. There's there's more in that category than there is for seniors. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm going to get to the part that everybody's probably wondering, how much money can you make off of this? Because <laughs> this, uh, this sounds very lucrative. It is. So the U.S. average... Um, What a senior's paying right now in assisted living care on average is $4,500 a month. Mm -hmm. So earlier I said that you can have six to 16 residents in a home. We'll go with 10 for easy math, $4,500 times those 10 residents. That's bringing you in $45,000 of of gross. You have your expenses, which should really fall for 10 people around $28,000 a month. Then maybe your debt service, let's say it's $5,000 a month for the house. This can be cash flowing you easily $10,000 a month net take home for you as the owner on just one of these homes. And in our training, we encourage you that if you're going to do this, you need to do it. So do like a three pack, do more than one. So you can share those resources. So you can share those staff. And when you say a three pack, what do you mean? Like three homes, like oh, okay. don't, do, don't do just one. It's, it's, it's a lot of effort to do this. So like, if you're going to do it, do it, you know? Gotcha. Okay. And you're saying between three homes, I could net 10 grand on each, on each, each, every month. <laughs> so every, uh, you know, se- senior person would have a, a room and yeah. then what, what's the criteria? Like, you know, for every three bedrooms, I need at least one bath, uh, yeah, so most people are going to want private bedrooms, private baths as much as 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 much as you can do, right? Yeah. So if you're in a state that limits you to six residents, that's pretty doable. You can have a four or five bedroom house with three or four bathrooms. Yeah. And that's yeah. really not that crazy. Here in Arizona, like I said, we're limited to 10. So my homes that I own are 10 bedroom, 10 bath homes. They didn't start that way. We renovated them to become that way. Mm. We have I just did a a tour with one of our students today in Georgia, and they have two properties, one 16 bedrooms. The other one's licensed for 20, actually. And the 16 bedroom one has 14 bedrooms. Every bedroom has a toilet and a vanity. And then they have exactly what you just said, a shower bathroom for every three or four bedrooms. So you can break it up however you want. There's really, unfortunately, it's kind of wild, wild west. There's really no rules and regs. Yeah. you're, you're, when I say average rate of 4,500, someone in that house who has the master bedroom with the biggest bathroom might be paying 6,000 and someone who has a shared bedroom might be paying 3,000. So the average 4,500, but within the house, there's different rates based on the bedroom, bathroom, whatever the situation is. That's a lot. It, it makes me think. And as, as I go through these episodes, you know, regarding real estate investing, Initially start off with just um, regular long-term rentals, right? You're making two hundred dollars of cash flow a month, and you're like, "Oh, hey, that's great! I'm doing great." <laughs> and then I kind of moved on to like people talk about self storage. That's the thing to do, especially during the pandemic, because people were putting all their stuff into self storage. But then now I'm hearing this. Well, Airbnb was next. Airbnb, yeah. And yeah. then now I'm hearing this, and I'm like, "Okay, why are more people talking about this? Yeah, uh, and doing something, something maybe it's they don't they don't know. Um, I don't know, but this is what I've been hearing about lately. And land, people yeah, have been buying up land, and people have been um, I've been hearing about senior, senior assisted living twice now, and how and how lucrative it is. And that's why when I saw this chance to to talk to, you, I was like, all right, I gotta I gotta hear about this because uh, you know, you're retrofitting these ho- these homes as long as you're uh, allowed to in your area. Um, cause I think the biggest home I've seen was one, I saw one down the street, like 20 minutes down the road. It was like a, it was like a six bedroom, four bath. Yeah. It's like 3,200 square feet. Um, yeah. where do you live? I live in Virginia, oh, okay. uh, Southern so Virginia. You so can like, have 12 residents in a home in Virginia. So if it was a six bedroom, it may have been shared bedrooms. Or if I was you, I would do a home like ours, like 10 bedrooms. That way you have maybe one or two that's shared, you know? Um, But yeah, definitely bigger, more luxurious properties. You want to make sure those demographics are right. You, you, you're not looking for where the 80, 90 year olds are living. You're actually looking for where the 50 to 70 year olds who are upper middle class live. Cause that's the adult child of the senior who's going to be paying 
for mom or dad to live in your home. So they're the ones searching and, and looking for the property. So you want to target that. We call it the daughter Judy, right? You want to target that adult child who's searching for the place. So where they live, eat, work, sleep, play. Which is what would make them comfortable. Uh, okay, got it. Like, oh man, he's a bunch of 20 year olds in his neighborhood. <laughs> no, exactly. If it's good for student housing, it's not good for us. <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) definitely more upscale, more luxurious, you know, better neighborhoods, better areas. You know, you want grandma to be comfortable. If you're going to an area where you need to bring your gun, we're not putting grandma there. You know, (laughs) yeah. So when it comes to renovating, are you finding off market deals in in order to find your place? Definitely. I think it depends uh, when you're you, you can find on or off. Honestly, if you're going to purchase a home and retrofit it for this, you're really looking at demographics. I don't really care about anything else. I want to first zone in on what area I want to be in specifically Mm -hmm. like neighborhoods, you know, like down that deep of, Hey, if this is a very good area, I want to be right near that. So really zoning in on that. Something that you might be looking at off-market deals for is if you want to purchase an existing one. So some people get in the game that way. They purchase an existing business and the real estate. The best deals of those will always be off-market because if they're listed somewhere, biz by sell or even on the MLS anywhere, then what if daughter Judy, someone whose grandparent or is in that home, what if they're a realtor and they see the home for sale? They're going to say, oh, my God, I need to take my mom out of the home. (laughs) They're selling the house, you know, so you don't want to publicize it if you're selling it. So almost all of those are off market deals. So if I'm looking for an existing, yes, I want off market. If I'm looking to retrofit or renovate a home, I don't really care if it's on or off because I'm going to be changing it and doing what I need to do to make it work, you know? Yeah. And okay, so I will I will make sure I say this then. Based off what the cash flow that you're telling me, it almost doesn't matter if you pay market price uh-huh. because you're going to make so much money back yep. from it. Uh, so, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter to you. And you're one of the few niches where it doesn't. Yep, exactly. And it's and I I know people are like freaked out of that because everyone's always searching for a deal, searching for a deal. But truly in this opportunity, it doesn't matter. It's the opportunity you're looking for, not focusing on getting the cheapest deal around. Yeah. Cause that's the, that's the thing that everybody is uh, struggling with right now, because you know, you know, the prices, the prices of homes have skyrocketed. It's like, how, how do I make these numbers work? And that's what actually changed me over to, to try an Airbnb because I'm like, yeah. if this model doesn't work, I still want to do real estate. How do I pivot? Yeah. Um, and so this is something else that as people are listening, maybe they could pivot into this to make those numbers work. Uh, You know, let's just say you don't have the time to write a bunch of letters to uh, people for off-market deals or to pay for somebody to do cold calls or you don't have the time to do that. This could be an opportunity for somebody that is still trying to be involved in real estate, have a good good cash flow. Obviously there's red tape, but so what? Um, I don't believe that anything worth having isn't, you know, there's always a little bit of uh, elbow grease as my father would used to say that you have to put into it. Uh, so I, I like it. I, I totally, I totally like it. Uh, so you are an academy. Let's let's talk yeah. a little bit about um, your your teachings, right? It's your programs. Uh, do you have like different package programs? Do you have different levels? How does that work? Yeah. So we do. We have an online home study course that you can kind of take at your own pace. That's a great kind of first place to just check it out if you're interested in that. We also host live three-day trainings here in Phoenix, Arizona, Um, and those trainings, everyone who's there teaching alongside with me, they're past students of ours who came through the training, opened their own homes, and now they're back to kind of teach and show you and bring you guys to that same success. So we definitely do not just teach on this. We do what we teach. We're in the trenches with you. I think that's really important because I hate when people just teach on stuff that they don't even know about, you know, it's like, come on. The theory. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So in our three day training, we really go over everything, finding it, funding it, filling it, however you want to get involved, whether it is just being a JV lender or partner, right? Not even owning the real estate, or maybe you want to own the real estate and lease it to an operator or own the real estate and operate the business. We kind of go over everything so you can find out whatever is the best role for you. Take that information and then go be successful. So we uh, love those, those classes. For I sure. love the fact that you have a JP and an LP um, options. 
Um, yeah. Maybe if somebody wants to get their feet wet, that would be their way. And for those that don't know, um, LP's limited partner in GP is uh, general partner. Uh, so yeah, that those are pretty cool options as well for those that I always like to say, uh, investing with training wheels when you want yeah. to kind of uh, learn that niche, you know, ride, you're paying to get the service, but you're also getting, you learn to get the, you're paying to get the knowledge, but you're also getting an interest back. So you make money to learn. I, I, I look at it like that as well. You said you're in Phoenix. Uh, do you get a lot of people from Cali, a lot of retirees from Cali? We, I mean, everyone from California is moving here. <laughs> It's yeah, not, it's been happening for, for several years. I just years. moved here a year and a half ago from San Diego, so uh, I'm in that bucket too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to live in um, I used to live in LA for a few yeah. years, and I remember yeah. that a lot of people were saying they're going to Tucson and, and Phoenix to retire down over there because homes. I mean, obviously they're way cheaper, and yeah. the homes are nice. I like I like the areas. Yeah. So I always like to say this, like. Yes, we have a ton of assisted living homes here or in Florida, right? Places where you mm. think of, oh, where do the old people live? Arizona Warm. and Florida. But this is the thing. People are getting older everywhere. If you grew up in Virginia and your whole life is there, just because you turn 85 doesn't mean you're moving to Florida. Like you're going to stay where you're from, like yeah. unless you'll probably move at 65 or you won't move at all. You know, like it, there's there's some point in your life where you just say like, nope. I'm here. You know, if you, if you didn't make that move, you're not going. So don't worry. We have students in all 50 States. You can make this happen anywhere, even in markets like California or New York, where real estate is more expensive. This is still totally doable and can happen really anywhere. So you're right, actually, because I told my mom, you know, I, I intend to move back to Cali um, after my son turns 18. And I was like, uh, Hey mom, we'll go back, you know, come with me. She's like, Nope, I'm staying here. I got all my friends yeah. uh, here. Uh, you know, cause we're from originally from New York. Uh, but she, we, you know, we've been down here for the last 20 years and even her fa- friends have moved down from New York yeah. down here as well. So she's like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm like, okay. So <laughs> I feel you guilty for it. leaving. <laughs> she, she wants to stay. Uh, even if she needs assisted living, she still wants to stay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. and then, uh, I have taught multiple times. I have my, my grandma, she's 75, but you, you couldn't tell, you really couldn't tell. And I would say she has probably another 10 years before she had still has her wits. Yeah. And, uh, I talked to my dad and my aunt about, you know, Hey, what are we going to do? She does not want to move, leave New York because yeah. she doesn't, she will, she don't trust the, uh, the medical down in the South, mm. you know, they they help, they have a lot of programs. They're really good up there, take care of her really well. And so, uh, that's also something I've, you know, I've been thinking about as well for my grandma. So this is something that I think is near and dear to a lot of people because, yeah. uh, who I love my grandparents, yeah. you know, I think a lot of people grow up knowing their grandparents or their, obviously their, their parents and they want to make sure they're good. And we've all heard the horror stories. It's even like, uh, uh, I think it was an Adam Sandler movie with that where it was uh, Ben Stiller was the that mean uh, nursing home. He was be- mistreating oh, yeah. his grandma. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. like quotes. <laughs> yeah, he's like, you know, she's like, how's everything? Everything's fine. He's like, 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 if you better tell him, like, you're being treated nice, you know. Uh, they made that to a joke, but I, 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 you know, I believe that a lot of jokes come from real sources. <laughs> yes, yes, I always say that, you know, like, I know a lot of your listeners are here to learn about real estate and stuff like that. And there's so many, we even mentioned it. It's you, sometimes you get shiny penny syndrome. It's like, I want to do Airbnb. I want to do crypto. I want to do this. I want to do that. (laughs) I think it's just important for you to like, think about your why and what your passion is. And a lot of times people don't think about this until it happens to them until their loved one needs care. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh my God, what are we going to do? And now reality hits this really is a solution for an older loved one in your life, giving them a place to live for free while you're cash flowing in the meantime. It's an opportunity for you to live for free if and when you ever need care. You don't have to burden your children or worry about that. You could just move right into your own home and not pay and then leave your children a cash flowing asset. And you know how cool would that be when you pass on to leave them with a house that's cash flowing 10 grand a month or more not a burden, such a blessing. It's kind of a three in one opportunity. So I love it as a real estate play, but I love it as an impactful, heartfelt play too, to take care of your own, honestly. Uh, that's something along the line that um, as I've been learning more, about, more and more about investing, it's good that we 
obviously we always want to make a profit in whatever we do. Uh, but what's been really meaningful is uh, when you're making a positive impact. And uh, I started learning that when I started talking to people about syndications, um, because you're impacting, let's say you're buying a 300 unit, you know, there's on average, maybe three people that live in that's 900 people that you are affecting in a community, right? And so what you do, you know, could be a positive or negative impact on that community for these senior people. They're not dead. They're, not, they're still part of the community. Uh, so we, it's, I think it's the right thing to take care of them. I think that I'm not saying that's something that's been lost on our society, but um, I don't feel like there's as much of an emphasis as it used to be when I was growing up or prior to where we, we take care of our, the elderly because they took care of us. Yeah. They're kind of like, oh, they're slow, you know, get out of the way. They're not as fast moving as they used to be. I think that's just kind of our way of uh, paying it back. So I like the fact that um, you're, you focus on that. I like the fact you've turned into an academy as well. So you're teaching it. And like you said, you're still doing it. And so what I always like to ask everybody, um, what is your rich state of mind? What is your big why as to why are you continuing to do this? And uh, what do you see? Your, uh, what do you see y'all in the future? I love that. Um, I think so. I told you that my dad and I got started in this business together because of my grandmother. Uh, he passed last October and I had built this company and about seven other companies with him. And when he passed, he left me his three homes, just like I said, cash flowing over 10 grand a month. That is an absolute blessing. And I feel that it is my job now to give that to as many investor entrepreneurs as I know that they can leave that same thing for their children or heirs or whatever they want. So I think my state of mind, my why and why I have to keep doing this is because I can't let this blessing just die with me. That would be selfish of me to say, thanks dad. And I'm good now. Like yeah. you set me up for life and I'll, I'll chill. No, I need to now give it back to everyone that I know and everyone who wants to do better and wants to provide something more. So that's kind of my why and why I have to keep doing this. <laughs> uh, what was your father's name? Gene. 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 It was Gene. Okay. I was looking at the uh, founder and president. I was like, oh, that's not her dad. Okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, um, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate your transparency as well. Um, I always, uh, I never take it for granted when people are um, willing to share some of their, their personal journey as to why they're um, so passionate about what they do. And it's kind of what gets you up every morning to probably or, or stay up that extra hour right when most people be like oh, I'm, I'm about to call it quits i'm gonna go to bed uh yeah. where can where can people find you uh, where can people find your academy yeah so the best website to go to and it's easy ral101.com when you go there there's a ton of free resources free books free webinars free whatever you want and if you want to have a discovery call our team is also there and available to talk through any of your one-on-one -on -one issues or questions but check that out, ral101.com. And you have a book coming out soon. I have a book coming out at the end of the year. I'm so excited for it. <laughs> Congrats. Uh, I'm assuming about this topic. Yes, it's okay. going to be a lot about that and just living a legacy and continuing that on. Oh, that's actually going to be a great book. And I, I'm going to look at Amazon to see if there's any <laughs> other book that has that niche. I'm very curious now yeah. because I can see you... Uh, being a number one seller in that Amazon top uh, category Thank and you. monopolizing uh, that category. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, with hard, hard work never goes unrewarded. And I, I could tell here that you definitely are a hard worker. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was really fun to be here. Thank you for sticking with us from the start of the episode. Please share our show with friends and family, visit our YouTube channel, and view more of our content on richstateofmind.com. See you next week on the Rich State of Mind show.